Everybody knows that I am about that fantasy football life. Me, G. Monetti, are going to be at Gillette Stadium in Foxborough, Massachusetts, Sunday, August 20th. And we're not going to be there alone this time. We're going to be podcasting, yes. But this time, we got Matthew Berry, Trey Wingo, Jim Brewer, and the motherfucking Gronk. The Dingo and the Gronk are meeting in Gillette. It's good, like it's like a fucking monster movie. The Dingo meets the Gronk live mm. in Foxborough, Massachusetts. Sunday, August 20th, live podcast to rest mock drafts, access to the field where the New England Patriots play. I am about that fantasy football life. Come up there, rock with us. It's all fantasy, everything. Me, Matthew Berry, Trey Wingo, Jim Brewer, and the motherfucking Gronk. Get in the fucking monkey cage live. Unless you're scared to dance with the dingo, you might be scared. Go to yeah. dancewiththedingo.com. Use the promo code DINGO to get $15 off your tickets. It's going to be a fantastic event. Restrictions may apply. Promo ends August 19th, 2017. See the website for further details. Dancewiththedingo.com. Me and my good friends at DraftKings were doing it August 20th at Gillette. Coming to the stage for 2015-2016 podcast calls of the year. G. Moody. And if you listen to the show, you know my voice is a little fucked up, so I can't scream and yell. I am Michael Rappaport. What up? What up, what up? What up, what up, what up? All right. Dallas. Usually I scream and yell when I come out. I I I I yell myself, but <clears throat> I'm on a no I yellow diet. <clears throat> if you guys are really good, I'll try to do it and then tomorrow for the big 3 games I won't be able to say shit. <laughs> so <clears throat> This is going to be a special show. I'm going to fuck your heads up a couple of times tonight. Yeah. I'm, I'm no gonna, doubt. I'm going to tell you that right now, that we're going to talk a lot of shit. There's going to be a lot of guests. Some you know about. Some you don't know about. Um, but I want to clear the air. Um, because me and the city of Dallas, I, I, I got the city of Dallas very upset earlier this year when I said I didn't understand what all the fanfare was, what all the, the parading was, what all the, all, the, all the carting around Tony Romo was for. Yeah, and the Pope Mobile and shit. They had him out here like he was Roger Storback, Tony Dorsett, yeah. or like Troy Aikman. Yeah. No disrespect to Tony Romo, but you guys should be fucking glad that he's gone. Yeah. All right, be glad that his body fell apart. <laughs> he had a great run, but it wasn't great enough. And I, I apologize, because I know Dallas loves their sports. You guys are as passionate and as into it, especially your football. I know exactly where I am. But what I did, shitting on Tony Romo and going viral and offending the whole great state of Texas, yeah. I shouldn't have been alone. You guys should have been having my back. <laughs> yeah. I should have been doing a, an Instagram video with the whole state of Dallas because now you got Dak and you can move on with your lives. Yeah. I also want to thank um, the great city of Dallas and the Dallas Mavericks for dismantling <laughs> the big three. That was a thing of beauty. That was a fantastic dismantling, disorienting right. of the Miami Heat, formerly the Miami Heatles. So I want to congratulate you guys on that. Dismantling. 
<laughs> and, and, you know, welcome back to mediocrity. <laughs> yeah. Listen to me. <laughs> I know Dennis Smith Jr., he's... He had, the, he had the, the, the greatest dunk that didn't go in all summer. Yeah. I saw it. Yeah. They hyped on that shit, man. Fucking headline news when a guy almost makes a dunk. A word. The Fucked skinny up. genification of sports. Absolutely. The misses count. Yes. I got my man Skin. Where's my man Skin here? ESPN. He's over there. We, what up? We, we, were just going, we were just going over that. And I saw that dunk. It was very impressive. But. <laughs> it didn't go in. But um, it didn't go in. So just so you know, you guys came to the show. I see my man David Snowden. Um, and I got, I got the guys in the back. So check this out. So I'm going to bring some dudes to the stage. We're going to get into some NBA. Yep. And, um, you know, there's two big fights on tonight. And these guys are all breaking my balls. Yo, I got to leave early. I got to leave early. And all that stuff. I tell them, hold their fucking head, man. See, I am Rapport Stereo Podcast. That's right. Hold your motherfucking head. So we're going we're gonna to do a little rotating chairs. I'm going to bring out the fellas, talk a little shit. Then I'm going to let them go. And then we're going to bring out some more fellas, talk some shit. And we can ask questions. Do it like that. <clears throat> I hope my voice isn't that distracting. You'll be all um, right. I'm, I'm sure everybody in here listens to the Iron Rapport Stereo podcast, right? Yeah. All right, so I'm going to bring out some guys. We're going to talk NBA. You guys, I'm going to let you guys ask questions. But listen, these guys come to the fucking show. Okay? Ask some good questions. If I, if I open the floor up, I want you to ask good, yeah. thought-out questions. Yeah. And keep it above the, above the, uh, above the belt. Right. All right, so I'm going to bring out Rashad Lewis, Brian Scalabrini, Mike Bibby, and Roger Mason to the stage. Come on out, fellas. You see, Scal, we're, we're not the same person. Two different people. Rashad Lewis, Sweet Lou, Roger Mason, Mike Bibby. This guy, I'll throw this fucking cocksucker out in the first 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm just yeah, playing get his with ass you. first. I'm just playing with you. you. Where's your socks at? Hey, hey, hey. Money ain't got no socks on. How can you be so fucked up? It's not even 8.30 yet. Give me five. Give me five. Give me five. Give me five. Wash your hands, man. man. Sit the fuck down. Don't say anything. Worse. All right. Fellas, first of all, thanks for coming. It's Saturday. I know you guys are busy. I know you guys want to watch the fight, but I appreciate the love. You could grab that. Is that one on? All right. So the first question I have, and I want to, I want to make it a round table. And I, and I want real insight. Okay, we're not on ESPN. We're not on Fox. We're not even on the big three. I want some fucking insight from you guys right now. I want you to help me. Roger Mason used to run the NBA Players Association. You know the ins and outs, right? Right, right, Mace? He's looking at me like, why did I come to this shit? <laughs> It's like, oh, Questionable shit. Questionable decision. <laughs> His face was like, what the fuck? Did I get myself in? No, I, I, I'll start this way, Scal. Look, I'm a New York Knicks fan. I know we're in Dallas. I've been put through the ringer. Give me some insight into Phil Jackson's tenure with the Knicks. Come on. Give me Come something, on, Scal. Why you got to ask Wait, me that Wait, first of all, question. let me ask you this. Of all the questions, what do I know? I know like what you know. Did Nothing. you ever play with No Gal one thinks he did a good job. You don't think, no one thinks that. There's no insight to that. Why? That's the worst question I've ever heard in my life. Uh. <laughs> That's what you start with? I want some fucking insight. I know Mace knows. Nobody knows. He doesn't know. Now, you played against him all the time. Yeah. You guys battled in Sacramento. When I, when I went, like it's been... 15, 16 years since the Sacramento Kings and the L.A. Lakers. When you, when you look back on that time, those rivalries with you and the Kings and, and the Lakers and the Kobe and the Shaq Lakers and, 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 and the Phil Jackson, like, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Like, if, if, you're, if your grandson 
when you finally start to look old, because you haven't aged yet. <laughs> like in 40 years from now, they say, what was that like being in those series? What are you going to say? We were kicking their ass. Mm. Got robbed. We were better. We were better. I think we were a better team than they were at that and time. And he says, but, but Grandpa Mike, you guys fucking lost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, How they, you answer that, uh, motherfucker? They have film of the games. They could go back and watch it. You know, they could go back and watch it. Well, what do you think? Like, what are you insinuating? Like, do you think I'm not insinuating anything. We are a better team than them. That's, it's simple. I didn't say, no, we just, they score more points than us. We are a better team than them, though. When, when, what was the dynamic? Because everybody's clear on who was, who was like, what the, the, the dynamic and dysfunction of the Lakers was, whether it was Shaq's team, Kobe team, whatever it was, it worked. Despite all the, dis your team, like, you know, as great as the Hall of Famer Chris Webber was, when it came down to crunch time, you were the guy, I mean, obviously Webber was fantastic, but like you were the guy that was taking and making the clutch shots. Was that just, how does that work? And you guys could, you, you could explain it to me. Like, how does it work? Because I'm so fascinated with, you know, the NBA. Like, when I'm around you guys for the big three, like, I look at everybody, right? And I'm like, this guy, at some point in his life, was the baddest, best motherfucker in his, in his city, in his state. You know, and you get to the NBA and you like a guy that's just a regular guy. Believe it or not, Brian Scalabrini at one point was the biggest, baddest motherfucker on his team. <laughs> you don't get into the NBA and not have that run where, you know, like it's the best of the best. But then you see guys, and you've all seen it, sort of disappear. Where like the, the great become, you know, you're not as great as this one and the notch goes down. But like you seem, and even in the big three, like you had, like whether it's the fourth quarter, you're down one or it's the first quarter and it's zero, zero. Like, you never seem to waver from that. Is that just part of who you are? I put Mike, my Mike, some people just ain't about that life. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't about that life. <laughs> you guys are about that life. <laughs> I go stand in the corner. You made big shots. I just put myself in, um, I worked hard when I played. Um, and every time, every shot I took, I put myself in situations where I shot this shot so many times that I felt every shot I shot was going in. You still think that? Right. Yeah, you got to. Rashard, because you are another ice in the veins. Yes. Your disposition, you're from the state of Texas, Houston. Great career. Big contracts. I mean, what is that? What is that? Like, like, like just that mentality. Is that like, like, because I, I think about it when the chips are on the line, you're relaxed. Like the greatest, you could see the relaxation. You know, LeBron, like the greats, greats, you guys, like there's never any, you know, like there's never any like fear. You know, and like and I feel like that mentality is, is, is like separates the greatest from like even the greats. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. What was that with you? Um, honestly, with me, I felt like the better the competition, the better I played the more that competitive edge comes out. I think uh, obviously in the NBA, like you said, it's hard to, when you're coming from college or high school, you're the man. But when you get to the NBA, you know, the talent level, everybody has talent. Everybody's tall, everybody's big, everybody's athletic. I think the, the, the guy that puts in the most work in the gym, um, and you can't teach that, that, that heart, you can't teach heart. Uh, guys with heart, they will step up in the playoffs. Guys separate themselves from regular season to the playoffs. When you see guys that step their game up in the playoff and championship games, finals, or if it's the Eastern Conference, Western Conference finals, those are the guys that that come out and play with heart and not are scared of the, the, the lights. Some guys can play in a regular season games and be an all-star, but you can't do the same thing in the playoffs. Right. Some guys are afraid of those lights. And I think the better the competition is, the, the, the I, I thrive on pressure. I love pressure. That's just the type of player I am. Who is a person or people, when I say that you played against, that, that you like, this is going to be the most fun, this is going to push me to the brink? Like, through your, I mean, you had a long career, but like, who are the first names that come to your mind when I say, this guy pushed me? Man, I, honestly, talking about that Sacramento team, when I was younger, playing in Seattle, playing against them, Peja Stoyakovich was a guy that got on my nerves, I mean... The way they passed the ball, you know, they were backdoor cut. Uh, but you had to push all the way up on him because he's going to knock the three down. I don't care if he's shooting it with his eyes closed. He's going to make that three. 
and he gave me fits. And then them as a team, the chemistry they had with Weber passing the ball. I mean, it was just he he was he he was a guy that that gave me fits. Pager. Oh, uh, Pager Stojakovic. I'm telling you, man, with with that team they had, it was unreal. Does it, does it, like, Mike, do you sometimes think about that team and, like, it, it was so close, so beloved. You guys had the cowbell in Phil Jackson <laughs> ear. Oh, that cowbell. Like, yeah, I, I think you guys bell. literally, <laughs> the crowd drove Phil Jackson fucking nuts. Yeah. yeah. It was an old school arena, too, so the, ten, the sound was, like, ten times worse than, you know, the, the bigger arenas now. So it was, like, everything was compact instead of, you know, the arenas that you see nowadays where they're more wide open, so. It was a good time. Yeah, it was fun. All right, Mason, you could start this symposium off. Scal, why are you eyeballing me like that? Scal, yeah. <laughs> ice grilling I'm listening you. to what you're saying. <laughs> I got to, I don't feel it's bad like for him. traffic accident. Because I got to, I got to hit first. Because if I don't hit first, he'll hit me. I don't know if you I'm guys waiting. have been watching the big three games. He's been very abusive to me on live TV. <laughs> Yeah, I got new outfits because of him. He's shaming I just, me. I just don't understand your dissension. Like, you were on movies, and now you're like the sideline reporter. I don't... <laughs> how does that happen? Oh. And Tell then I come out here, and I see, are you, guys, are you guys here for us? Fuck or are you no. here for him? I know these guys are here for him, but the rest of you guys are here for us. <laughs> I told him that shit, right? Like, explain it to me. Explain it, like... Does it happen gradually, or do you, you know, do you come out there and know that you are heading down to doing sideline reporting? You ain't even a full-time guy. You got a girl that we all want to watch. You're like a part-time guy. You're like sideline reporter two. <laughs> all right, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. See, I told you, don't feel bad for this fucking guy. He's the only guy in Texas who's walking around the whole state with his shirt tucked in. And he's talking shit. Oh, whoa, yeah. That's how I roll, man. Damn. It's 97 degrees out. <laughs> and you all never, Brian Scalabrini, he walks around like he's like big bull chest. He's like this, no, with yeah. his shirt tucked in. <laughs> all right, Mason. Kyrie Irving, what the fuck happened this week? What happened? I want you guys, like, so, things are going good. You know, I have my frustrations with LeBron. Nobody has any problems with Kyrie. You can't not love his game, his style. Of course, I think that, and I'm sure you might agree with this, Mike. If any good point guard, if they do six moves, eventually they're going to get by a person. I don't know why it takes them six moves to get by a person. But other than that, I fuck with Kyrie. He's a yeah, Marcus Haynes. <laughs> <laughs> Motherfucker like Marcus Hayes out there. Yeah. The defender just gives up. They're yeah. like, fuck. Fuck it. Go. <laughs> Make the layup. <laughs> Isaiah Thomas used to be like, boop, boop, one and out. But I love, I, I love Kyrie. W what happened? They Man. won championship. They came close, even the two times they lost. First of all, it's, it's a what have you done for me lately, league, world, that's what we live in. So the championship two years ago is a long time ago, but I think you know how I feel about that, that, that whole reporting. I feel like that Kyrie trade announcement is a little bit misleading because, Why? well, my inside sources have, yes. have... I told you, Roger Mason is the guy. He's that dude. He knows what's going on. Yeah. That's why he's looking at me like he's yeah. scared to death. He's like, why, are you, why am I here? Yeah. <laughs> give, me, give, me the, give me the above board stuff. No, I mean, from my standpoint, I've heard that Cleveland was trying to trade Kyrie for some time. And the, and the rumor mill was that they were trying to get rid of him early in the summer. Um, and word got back to Kyrie that they were trying to trade him. And so it's one of those situations where it's like, man, you know, you're hurt. You feel like a team that you won a championship wants to get rid of you. Well, now that I know that, yeah, I want to trade. Right? Like, yeah. And so I feel like he came back and let them know, yeah, I'm okay with a trade, and it was spun to make him the bad guy. And I, I hate that type of stuff. Now, now, how, how did it get to that? Because you're telling me this, and I'm not going to tell who the other big three person was telling me a whole other perspective. Because, you know, it's like, you know, you guys all know people. You, you know this one. You hear this. You hear that. 
You know, another person sort of made me feel bad for LeBron, which is against everything in my DNA. <laughs> but, 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 but the thing that I, I, I'm most curious about is he's under contract for the Cleveland Cavaliers. How the fuck? Do you, do you, like, if I'm under contract for somebody and I said, well, I want to stop, they're going to be like, they're not even going to take my call. They're going to just be like, what do you, like, how did the NBA get to a point from a business side well, where you can say, I want to be traded? And I know they don't have to trade him, but all things are leading to the fact they're going to train him. But with other players, will they just say, I want out? Well, there's, an, a, there's, a, there's different levels to players in the NBA. You've got your role players who can't do shit. You've got no role, no nothing. You just take what you get. you got your mid-tier players that, you know, they, they're solid. They might have a little bit of say. Then you got your superstars who play by different rules. It's just the reality of the NBA. And I think, you know, guys like Kyrie, you know, LeBron's in another stratosphere, but guys like Kyrie, they do have the ability at times to speak to management. And I think for somebody that's brought a championship to Cleveland, they don't win a championship without him, period. He hit that shot, that shot, we've seen it a million times, they don't win one. So there's a respect level there. And I think the fact that they wanted to move him, I think he's being proactive and saying, look, yeah, I'm cool with it. Uh, yeah, I want to be moved too. But they just spun it, and now everybody's looking at Kyrie like you're a bad guy. Why would you want to leave LeBron? So, so I know you, you're not a fortune teller. So if you guys were to say, based on everything you know, is Kyrie Irving going to play for the Cleveland Cavaliers at the beginning of the season? Scal? Yes, I mean, I don't see any way Cleveland can move him and get better at all. So if they're not going to make a move, you get worse. So I don't see how this happens. Rashard? Yes, I think he's still in Cleveland just because of the fact uh, he's worked a lot. You're not going to trade him for, for nothing. And I think they hold on to him and maybe try to get rid of him before the trade deadline. Damn. Yeah, he might want to bring his talent to South I, Beach. I don't, I, don't see, I, don't, I don't see any way that he's in training camp unless they go sing Kumbaya somewhere. I mean, at the end of the day, like how can he go back in that locker room when everybody knows that he doesn't want to be there? I don't see it. Yeah, LeBron, 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 LeBron likes to fight. He, he, he likes to fight guys 6'3 and under. The only guy I've ever seen in his whole career, because LeBron is not a dirty player. He's not a shit talker. He's not. But the only person I've ever seen him talk shit to is that famous image of doing it to Steph Curry. That's the only person, because he damn sure didn't do it to Deshaun Stevenson. Uh, he don't got him. He in the championship eight years, bro. Yeah, and I, I didn't say he wasn't great. Uh, I, that doesn't mean I have to, you know, listen, people like the, the Transformer movies doesn't mean I have to go see them. <laughs> Bib, what's your, what's, your, what's your best Kobe story in his prime? You, you, you were fucking there neck and neck with this he, dude. He was probably one of the best players I've probably seen as far as um, how hard he worked and how much tape he studied and stuff like that. I mean, just... To see him go out there, it's like a second coming of Michael Jordan almost. Who is the biggest? You, there's probably a few. Who, who talked the most shit during your tenure? GP. Michael, jo <laughs> Mike, Michael Jordan. Really? Give, me, give, me, give, me, give, me, give me Michael Jordan's story, uh, Roger. Nah, so Michael, MJ, I'm from D.C., and MJ was playing for the Wizards. So this is not... Chicago Bulls. I'm not that old. It's just not. I mean, it's not Chicago Bulls, Michael Jordan. But this is Washington Wizards. And my rookie year, we we had the same trainer. I don't think I might have only played 15 minutes. I don't think there was a minute he wasn't talking shit to me. Damn. And and is his shit talk like, it, like, cause there's different kind of shit talking. There's like scowl shit talking. There's like, like I shit talk when I play. It's more like, you know, I'm not. In my best day, I was never like. Talking about your game, I would more try to get with you emotionally. Is he talking about your game? Is he talking about your sneakers? Is he talking about your haircut? Like, what was Jordan shit talking like? Everything that he was saying to me was kind of like a fortune teller. I'll give you an example. Like, as soon as I got in, he said, oh, young fella, they're going to call three fouls on you right away. <laughs> I looked at him. But no, seriously, he got it in the post. He gave me a little shimmy. Gave me a pump fake. I didn't jump the first one, didn't jump on the second one. The third one I jumped, and they literally called three fouls on me in three minutes. Damn. Seriously. <laughs> so for him, it was like, oh, they about to call this foul on you, young fella. Yeah. Boop. 
He knew Young what fella, it was. you're too close. Boop. <laughs> Young fella, you about to go sit down because you're going to get a boop. And in your head, are you like, what the fuck is going on? Flat out. Are you like, I'm in a blender? Like, what, what, like, are, is it like, when you guys are playing, I'm fascinated by this. When you guys are playing against, who is the person, Scal, your, your, your early years, where you're like, oh shit. Like, I can't believe that I'm playing basketball with this person. Like, I had the, the blessing of working with Robert De Niro. So, you know, like, you know everything's happening, right? You know you're going to get there. You know, like, I'm like, you know, going to be cool and normal. Like, I'm, you know, inside, I'm like, oh, what the fuck? But then you get to a thing where that director says action, and he's doing his thing, and I'm like, you know, like, I'm there, and I'm like, in it. But, you know, as soon as they say cut, you know, and a minute walks away, a minute passes, I'm like, very aware, like, that's my fucking guy. Who, when you were, were you on the court with, where you had that moment when you were, like, first in the league? So it was Rasheed Wallace, that's for me, because... I, I watched him in Jeez. Portland, and I don't think you, I mean, I, he's one of the most talented players to ever play this game. I mean, for whatever reason, he's not on that level. But for me, it was just like, I should not be out here guarding him. I should be on the bench right now. <laughs> How good was Rasheed? He was like ahead of his time because he was like a stretch four before there was stretch four. Let me tell you what happened. <laughs> pulling the table. So Rasheed, you know, Rasheed talks a lot of smack, right? So... They threw the ball into Rasheed. And I'm right there like. <laughs> Rasheed takes the ball, he looks over, he goes, oh my gosh, you put him on me? <laughs> I'm gonna I'm lock this dude up. There's no way I'm gonna allow him to do that. It's like, oh, I'm gonna hit him with a fadeaway. Hit me with a fadeaway, high release. I jumped as high as I could, didn't matter. Kissed it off the glass. Sub, <laughs> I'm out. Man. That, Man. that is where I felt the most embarrassed ever in my life. And you were young. He looked at the coach, at our coach. You put him on me? During the game. During, I, he took a look. You know how we, you know, when you catch the ball in the post, you gotta take a look, right? He, he looked right at my coach. I felt Damn. like. For you, how old were you when you came in the league, Rashard? 18. 18 Damn. years old. Yeah. From Houston, Texas. From Houston, Texas. Out of high school. <laughs> Out of high school. So you make it to the NBA. Mm -hmm. Your first game, you're 18 years old. Yeah. So what was your first moment where you were like, I'm here? I'm going to tell you what That's happened. It's fucking nuts yeah. that you were 18 years the old. The first day I walked in the gym, this is the year I got drafted, it was a lockout year. So we didn't actually start playing, I think, till like January. So obviously we couldn't work out at the facility. Uh, couldn't. So after the lockout was over, we report, I reported to Seattle, and this is a week before training camp start. And uh, me and Jelani McCoy, we was both rookies that year, and some guy, one of the trainers came and picked us up to bring us to the gym. So as soon as we walk in the gym, they're already playing pickup games. They're already playing up and down. As soon as we step in the gym, Gary Payton is dribbling the ball up the court. And he stops the game in the middle. As soon as we walk in, he stops the game. He just stops dribbling. He looks over at me and Jelani. Where the fuck have y'all been? Wait, why are y'all late? What the fuck are y'all doing? Y'all supposed to be here early. Y'all supposed to be getting up shots. And me and Jelani looked at each other and we pointed to the trainer. And he was like, I don't give a fuck. Y'all supposed to be here. I have my homeboys pick y'all up. So, and he was just going off for like five, ten minutes. And that's how I met Gary. <laughs> Damn. My rookie year, that's, that's how I met him. As soon as I walked in the gym, and I'm a kid, I'm a teenager, you know. 18 years I, I don't old. know what the hell I'm getting myself into. I just know I'm nervous already. I just know I need to come in here and just bust my ass and work, just run, just run everywhere. And as soon as we step in, he cussed us out. So I went into my little shell like, oh, shit. <laughs> how long did it take you to come out of it? Well, once we started playing pickup, I mean, I felt like he was on the court and I had to go out there and play hard. I wasn't necessarily making threes or I just played like a Tasmanian devil, rebounding and just loose balls. I just did whatever. I just played hard because I didn't want him to yell at me. <laughs> I was scared as hell. So. And it worked out. <laughs> That's good. Bib, you, when you, when, how old were you when you came out of Arizona? Um, I just turned 20. When you, me and Rashard in the same draft. So what year was this again? 98. Okay. Jesus yeah. Christ. So we came in at the same time. And, uh, You're a national champion. Uh-huh. You're no, in I, Arizona. I one more year. I left after my sophomore year. But the freshman year? Freshman year, we won championship. Yeah. Okay. So what was that first time where you were like, oh, shit? 
um, at like the draft. I'm here. At the draft, when you know, when you go up there, you get your hat, and you know, like the Rashad said, you're still a kid at you know, 19, 20 years old, and um, just to fulfill my dream was good enough for me. No matter how good I did playing or whatever, just get drafted was good enough for me. And that's dope. Yeah. That's dope. Absolutely. What is what do, what is uh, former commissioner David Stern's hands feel like? Are they clammy? <laughs> Are they soft? Moisture. Small and hard. Small and hard. Yeah. It's better than small and soft. <laughs> All right, I'm going to get one more story, and I'm going to let you guys go. <laughs> Scalabrini, you played on the world champion Boston Celtics, who this, this, this season, for some reason... The start of the big three. Get, get, <laughs> so you, dude, give him the mic, G. You know Ray is my man, because I played with Ray Allen in Seattle, and then... We played together in Miami, won a championship together. So I, I, I don't know the true story, but I got to have my man back. So I, what the fuck happened? Yeah, they hate Ray. <laughs> so here's how. They know, became the real housewives yeah, of Boston. They hate Ray. You know how in the, real in the NBA, those guys, and, those, there's, and Jordan was like this, guys who fabricate stories in their head to motivate themselves that year. When Ray went to Miami, they made this like, it's us against the world mentality. Even though, even though they tried to trade Ray that year, even though they started Avery Bradley, you know, when a guy leaves, you're just like, well, he went to Miami, so you, you say, all right, forget that. It's, it's us against them, and, and those guys, by far the most competitive team I've ever been around. The funniest story, you're, you're going to want the arm wrestling story, but I'll show you this one. If uh, Sam Cassell was on our team, if, if we were like, all right, let's watch film, and you know how sometimes the film guy messes it up real quick, right? If he messed it up for like one second, Sam would bring out the dice like, ch -ch 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 -ch. hold that. And it was like, that's our team. We were gambling all the time. Dice, <laughs> cards, bet on a free throw, bet on a three, bet on half court, bet on. You talking about Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett. Uh, it was one more guy. I could remember because the All-Star game, I made the All-Star game. I don't know which All-Star it was, but halftime, we come in, coach getting ready to give a speech. They now de dealing cards and... <laughs> I'm like, we, it's halftime of All-Star game. They in there like, let's go, let's go. So, so, so Mike wants the, the arm wrestling story. So the arm wrestling story is that, that two weeks before this event, where everyone's arm wrestling everyone. And, you know, Big Baby is really just like mowing down. Do you guys know Big Baby Davis? Okay. By the way, he, a freak of nature when it comes to how strong he is. But he's just mowing down the competition. You know, I, I think he messed up Eddie's shoulder, but two weeks of arm wrestling and, and everyone's would arm these, wrestling. Would these arm wrestling happen on the plane? Where were you? Like we were, the big baby arm wrestling would happen everywhere. So it went on for two weeks. <laughs> Finally, in the middle of a card game, KG stands up and like, hey, Funk, sit down, we about to arm wrestle. So you know what I'm thinking right away? Like, I just saw Big Baby mow down the whole team. Like it was easy. So I'm thinking, this is going to be the moment. This is going to be the one moment where Kevin Garnett loses. This is going to be the moment where like we're going to see his ego hurt. And I mean, I, I, I was like convinced. So they sit down and it's ready, set, boom. And right away he started looking at him like, I ain't moving, Funk. I ain't moving. And he just started sweating. Just start, I mean, it started car coming off. I ain't moving, Funk. I ain't moving. And he just sat there. I'm not moving. And Big Baby's uh, uh, and he, he wouldn't, I ain't moving. I ain't moving. I ain't Minute 30 later, I guess Big Baby got tired. You know, he kind of got tired when he played. Big... That's my guy, by the way. He's my guy. KG just started, and, and I mean, I'm telling you, there's no possible way he should have won that. But he came down, and he won. Then he stood up. He turned around, had his uh, wife beat her on, sweating. He's like, I'm the silverback gorilla in this motherfucker. Don't y'all ever forget it. <laughs> like, damn. <laughs> and the only guy that had his back was Paul Pierce. I got 10000 on KG. Everybody took the money. Every bet, 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 he won. He beat everybody. He won I mean, the he bet. Won, everybody won. thought that Big Baby Pierce, was going to win. Pierce had the only guy that had KG's back. Everybody else bet against him. That's a good. And this happened on a plane. Oh, yeah, 35,000 feet up in the air. Shit. Most competitive group I've ever been around. It, it's not even close. All right, listen. I'm going to let you guys go. 
Text me what's going on with the fight. I can't tell you how much I appreciate all four of you coming up here and rocking with me. I'm sure the crowd appreciates it. And I'll see everybody tomorrow. That was dope. All right, how's everybody feeling? The shooter is in. Uh, the young shooter is in LA. We we could have brought him here because yeah. we brought him to San Francisco and the crowd like they like mold him. Yeah. All right, so. Shard Lewis told a great story about Gary Payton. So right now I'm going to bring out motherfucking Gary Payton. GP. GP in the motherfucking hit out. GP, all the favor. What up? <laughs> get, get, get Gary a mic. I see y'all down, down here cussing the shit out of everybody. Well, Gary, I... I ain't going to do all that bullshit. You know what I'm saying? We did that for out, you, you motherfucker. Know? Well, fuck it then. I'm with it then. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, before I get to Gary Payton, because who listens to the I Am Rap Horror Stereo podcast? <laughs> now, now, when I was telling people to come to this, to this podcast, I, I said something at the end. I said, I tell you, if, if you come to the show, I'm going to, what did I say? I said I was going to blow your fucking mind, right? Word. And I'm not one of these people. So when I tell you we sell Buttersoft t-shirts, I'm selling Buttersoft t-shirts. When I'm telling you I'm going to blow your fucking mind, I bring Ice Cube to the stage. Yeah. Word. Yeah, yeah, what's happening? So... I'm in heaven right now. Word. Because when we started this little podcast, I never thought I would be doing a live show in Dallas. And I never thought that I'd be on the stage here in Dallas for the big three with Gary Payton, Hall of Famer, NBA champion, Hall of Fame shit talker. Yep. And Cube, I'm gonna just I'm gonna just tell you this right now, because I've 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 fawned over these guys on the court. And I look at you as sort of a contemporary as a business person. But when I go home after the big three games, when I went home after I auditioned with you in higher learning, when I went home after doing my day's work on next Friday, I always said, I cannot fucking believe I got to work with Ice Cube. But I was Absolutely. such a fan before I knew you. Yeah. And I can't believe you guys came to do this. Well, shit, let me tell you something. <laughs> Fuck that. See, he don't know this, though. I ain't told him, though. You know, we, we cool like that. But every day, I listen to him on... on I, I rock him every day on my iPad. When I'm on the plane, I listen to straight him. I got every one of his, his uh, albums in my iPad, and I rock him. You know what I'm saying? And you know which one is the right one. No Vaseline. Oh. We right in the ass. Fuck you yeah. know what I'm saying? So, yeah, that's what I'm talking Hell about. Yeah. I so, appreciate all the love, man, for rap. GP, man, that ain't nothing but love, man. You know, that's what you do it for, you know, for people that you respect, people that you love, you know what I mean, to love what you do, respect what you do, you know what I mean? That's what it's all about, you know, ultimately. Well, I appreciate it. I'm not going to keep you guys that long, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to just throw this at you like this, Q. Did you ever, like, when you left, we could get right into hip-hop. When you left NWA, that decision, that seemed like the craziest decision in the world. Yep. This is like a, a hip hop group that became like a rock and roll group. You're selling records. We, it appears to the, to, the, to the fans that you're making money. Obviously, that was one of the reasons that you left. Did you ever imagine that you would go from the image, the persona of Ice Cube, NWA, the persona of Ice Cube, the, the, the solo hip hop artist to, I mean, like to becoming like, like an icon and like to creating, like to becoming like, you're like a Steve Jobs type of motherfucker. Like mm -hmm. you had this idea to create this big three league and 
you know, a lot of people could come up with that, and you could, you could attest to the fact that even with everything that you've put into it, it's still a challenge. So when you, when, when you look back at your career, the question I have is like, are you like ever like, I can't fucking believe that I wound up here from when you had the crack tooth and the jerry curls? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Um, like, did you see it coming or like, I mean, I know you can't, you can't, you can't see this coming. You can't see it coming. You just gotta, you know, do good work. You gotta put in good work. You gotta believe in yourself, um, believe in your ideas. You know, even if everybody tell you, you crazy. I mean, everybody told me I was crazy, uh, when it came to the big three, it was like, man, you have a nice, comfortable life. You know what I'm saying? Why do you want to throw yourself into 18-hour days to try to pull this off? And we did it in six months. Wow. But the thing is this. It's really all about determination. It's all about uh, recognizing your opportunities. And it's all about not holding yourself back. So, you know, that's really what it's all about. Yep. And um, and when you grow up like we grew up, it's really courage is there. The courage is there. So nothing going to scare you. You know what I mean? Nothing going to scare us. So we got the courage. We just need, you know, uh, people, good people to work with. And I got a great team of people that, that helped me. You know, you don't get here by yourself. You don't do these things by yourself. You know, you have great people. And I mean, GP, you know, to achieve the things that he achieved on the basketball court, he'll tell you, you know, coming all the way up, it took people to help him become the glove. It ain't just one man doing it. And let me ask you, because Gary, you're a fan, and we'll jump back to basketball. You're a fan of hip-hop, and I want both of you guys to talk about this. I talk about this all the time. I'm just a fan of hip-hop. I have no stake in it. I made no money off of it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just a fan. I'm so worried, concerned about where we're going. There's good artists, you know, but there's so many fair-weather rappers, like, as a fan of hip hop, as a fan, as a participant, as an icon, as a pillar of the shit, where's your head at with hip hop right now? Just as like an overseer, as somebody who like, you're part of it. You're part of building it where people can just, like Kylie Jenner can post an Instagram video with some random rapper and then the random rapper sends a million, it sells a million records. Like that's where we're at right now. Like the whole thing concerns me. Like when, what do you see when, when I ask you like about the landscape of hip hop? Well, I see, you know, where it's always been. It's, it's where it's always been. You have good artists and you have a whole bunch that suck. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's, that's always been yeah. in hip hop, you know? Um, so that's not going to change. You know, what, what's great is you get to see these guys who, when they do come out and they stand light years ahead of the rest, you really, you get, get to see the, artist that has come out of the muck to to shine and that's that's great too uh so i i'm always in love with hip-hop um you know rappers come and go but hip-hop is to me the kind of the form of 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 street creation you know what i mean done at the highest level and it's just it's, to me, it's always great to see what people come up with. So I'm a fan on a whole different level. And GP is like, you got me up here and ask me a fucking question, man. I'm like, damn. <laughs> what? Sitting up here, come up here to go to sleep. Yeah, he ain't talking no shit now. Pull me off the, out the hotel. Let you know what I mean? Hey, GP shit. got shit to do. Shit. <laughs> With QB and shit, he running this shit, so I'm with it. All right, you know GP, I'm, I'm going to throw this to you. I, we'll jump into basketball. I was asking Rashard Lewis, what was the first time when he, when he got drafted, 18 years old, you know, where he was like, oh, shit, I can't believe in the NBA. And he said, your loud ass was that person. So for you, who was the, what was the first sort of like, I can't believe I made it moment when you got into the league, when you were just out of Oregon, you're young, 
loud, abrasive. What was that moment where you were like, or did you never have that like, oh shit moment where you always just so cocky? I can't imagine yeah. that. Tell me, shit. what was that first yeah, moment? Yeah, I had that oh shit moment when Michael Jordan tore my ass up in the first game. <laughs> shit, he had 35 and I had like zero and I sat on the bench. Your rookie yeah. year? My rookie year, yeah, because I played him in um, preseason and I had a good game against him. And then what I didn't understand is in preseason, they don't play. You know what I'm saying? They, shit, they just be bullshitting around, you know, and he, he, he was a man. So, you know, I thought I did something. I had like 21 on him and stuff. And talking he to him? Talking crazy. And then all of a sudden, first game, we had to play him in Seattle, and we went out to the, to the tip, and he said, hey, hey, young fella mine, don't nobody guard him while he in the game. So then all of a sudden, I had two fouls in about one minute and stuff, and then... Sat man. on the bench, man, and then I said, wow, this is it, man. And, you know, I, I knew I had to step my game up. When all this talk, you know, I, I, I think it's a, a silly conversation, but it's good for podcasting. And Cube, you could, you could answer this. People talk Jordan. He's sort of by himself. But there's this Kobe, LeBron, you know, Magic, Larry, you know, Isaiah. You know, but it really comes down to these three people. It's Jordan, LeBron, LeBron, Kobe. Cube, you're an L.A. dude. You played against all these dudes. You played with them. Who's the best basketball player out of all of them, or is it unanswerable? Let me answer that, Cube. They all, they all different. And ain't nobody could compare to Jordan. Ain't nobody could compare to Kobe. Ain't nobody could compare to LeBron. I think they all in different, different, different um, eras to me. Uh, everybody going to say Jordan was the best, which he, 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 he could be that. He, you can't have a, a fight for that. Uh, but you got to still understand, you still got the Magics, you still got the Kareems, you still got a lot of people that can play basketball, but, you know, I don't compare them. I, I can't compare them like that. I, I think they're all their own person. They're all going to be greats. You know, uh, they talking about uh, Mount Rushmore. It should be about 20 round, uh, Mount, people on Mount Rushmore, so I don't compare them. I think all of them is great. They're all good. There ain't nobody better than the other one. I played against all of them. Wasn't scared of now one of them. Gave them all the blues. <laughs> So, shit, I gave them all the blues, so it, it's why they gave me the blues back. So, it, it was good, you know, it, it was just, a, it's a fight, and I think all of them is good. Now, if they want to handle it, you know, they can sign up for the big three next year. Yeah, can, exactly. You know, they can get out there. We want to see that you know, shit, we can too. see different eras get down. Hell yeah. You know what I mean? It's no problem, because we got different eras out there playing against each other. Especially so, Kobe. There it Especially is. Kobe, so Kobe need to come out there. There it yeah. is. Kobe half court. This would be beautiful for Kobe. Yes. She would get 50 every game. You, you guarded these dudes. You were known for being a defensive person. But in all, like you had it both sides, but the defense is what people talked about, which is a rare thing, especially for a point guard, especially for somebody who doesn't shut the fuck up. Yeah. Like, usually the defensive <laughs> guys are quiet. You know, they just want to do their job. The Joe Dumars, you know, well, Rodman wasn't really like that. But, but for somebody that was, I mean, but you made defense cool. Like, you made defense almost the offense. Like, and you did it in such a, you know, verbose, aggressive way. Which is the guy that was like, like, what were their ten? Here, Kobe and, and Jordan. If somebody, your grandson, 50 years from now, what was it like guarding Michael Jordan? What was it like guarding Kobe? What do you tell them? Fun. Hella fun. You know, it was, it was, it was fun to me because I, I, like, I look forward to guarding um, Jordan because that was, that was, um, he was a premier guy in offense and I was a premier guy on defense. Uh, but if I want to say the two that, that was more difficult, um, I would say Kobe. Because the simple fact is, is that he ran around and did more than Jordan. Jordan would go on to the block and you know where you can go. And I could try to prevent him from getting there. You know, Kobe would do a lot of more things because he wanted to score a lot more than, than, than Jordan was. But Jordan was the most efficient one. He was more efficient. You know, so LeBron is just bigger. He was a bigger guy. I had to get up underneath him. I only got to guard him for um, a, a couple of years. But I had to get under him and, and, and get, take away his legs. The most difficult guy for me to ever guard, and we haven't even talked about it, is John Stockton. Why? Uh, yeah, because um, he hounds the ball. No, he ain't dirty. We just stupid <laughs> because we get, we get picks and shit. We get caught on the picks. You know, so, but I think because he handled the ball um, most of the time, 100% of the time. When you got a guy that's, that's got the ball all the time, coming off picks, um, you know, setting picks, doing other things. Then he shoots the ball only 12 times and he makes nine. 
He gets 16 assists. He shoots nine, 10 free throws, and he makes nine. And then all of a sudden, they, you, they look around, he has seven rebounds. And then all of a sudden, he has um, probably about four or five steals. Look at his stats. If he got 20, 16, seven, five steals, and all of that, mm -hmm. and he's shooting 52 or 55% from the line, who do you want to guard? Mm. Uh, that, that, he, he, I don't want to guard him because he's too much. Well, did he ever get, like, he seemed like he was almost, like, robotic. Did he get phased by any of you, you, you getting in him? Like, he'd ignore you, engage back? Yeah, he ignored me. See, that was, I hated him to, for, to a passion because I could talk shit to him, and he would just look at me like I'm stupid, and then he'd just walk on. And then I'm like, yo, you don't hear what the hell I'm saying to you? And then he'd just keep walking, you know, the dirty socks and all, you know what I'm saying? And that's just the way the game was. And then I got smart and I stopped talking to him and then I just started punishing him, you know, putting him on the block and punishing him a little bit more, punishing him here. And then he started switching up. He started having uh, Byron Russell guard. <laughs> so I said, OK, yeah, that's good. Let me get away from him. You know, so it was it was one of them things. And, and who was a person like that would, would that would you would be like talked out? Who would give you a sore throat that would that would keep talking back to you? Like if I said to you. Who is your favorite shit talker? To, like, who would you Skinny say? Skinny ass Reggie Miller. With his yeah. 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 Reggie, Reggie talked too damn much. Boy, I try to talk and he'll talk right back and then he'll hit a three in your face and then he'll come back and hit another three in your face and then be like, boy. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? And, you know, and then you got to go at him and then he don't want to guard you with his scary ass. He over there. You know, so you can't go back at him. So, you know, you know, Reggie, boy, he talked too much. Talk too damn much. You, you, you tell now you me say I, I'm talking too much. Yeah. Now he talked too much. That motherfucker talked too what? much. And, and then he busted your ass with threes. And you uh. know what? He he took he took everything personal. You know that after he retired, I ran into him in a club. Said something to you, didn't he? He said something to me like he wanted to fight me. <laughs> I said, it's over you. You did great, man. We made you a, a fucking Hall of Famer without us. Without the, the Knicks. Knicks. Yeah. Without Spike Lee and all this shit. Yeah, you wouldn't be in we, that Hall of Fame. We would push you to the next level. You should be thanking me. He's like, you done talking shit? I was like, yeah, I'm fucking, I'm not even a part of the team, man. <laughs> Swear to God, he said that to me. I was like. I mean, you got that dumbass Knicks hat on. What you expect? <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. Take, take that shit off, shit off man. Uh, take that shit off. Take that shit off, man. Take right. that shit off. Damn. And it's funeral black and shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's funeral Don't black. Because you know. Don't wear that shit no more. Yeah, that was the 2017 Knicks for Knicks hat. The, the funeral black. Funeral black. <laughs> All right. Ah. Give him his hat back, please. <laughs> Somebody. Yeah, y'all got to give him his hat back, though. Hat I don't back, know who please, would want man. that. For real, for real. He's losing Listen. his swag. <laughs> no, no, I definitely don't want your Trump hat. Yeah. Oh, this, this no, you shouldn't even be Trump up hat? in here then. <laughs> Shit. You take your ass up out of here. How the fuck you got that? How the hell you got a Trump hat? What? Fuck wrong with you? Yeah. This motherfucker is crazy, man. Hey. <laughs> you drunk, Run man. You gotta be drunk. Here. Yeah, you is you drunk. drunk. Yeah, yeah word. I smell that man, bro. You got a Cincinnati Red shirt on, too. Get that shit up out of here. What the fuck is going on, man? Where the security at? Yeah. <laughs> Y'all good, man. <laughs> Get you a big three hat. <laughs> All right. I said, I told you I was going to fuck your heads up. Like, I'm really, like, tripping out because I knew this was going to be a great podcast. And it's going to get greater because I'm going to bring up two more people. Yes. That are here. I'm going to bring up. NBA champion, Dallas Maverick, Deshaun Stevenson. I know you're here. Yeah, yeah. Deshaun. And then while Deshaun is getting us to the stage, because I'm tripping out that I actually got these people at, the, at this podcast. I'm, I'm, I'm bugging out. Yeah, we're missing a fight. I know, I know. I'm going yeah, to yeah. let you go. I'm going to let you go. We're playing musical chairs. I'm going to bring out... In my opinion, the true king of New York, Charles Oakley. Yeah. King of New York. All right. Yeah. I'm bugging out. All right. So, Deshaun, you know what? I'm going to let. Cube, you want to go watch a fight? No, man, I'm kicking it here. All right, all right, all right. 
Because I'm like, you want to go watch Deshaun's like, I want to watch the fucking fight too. All right, Deshaun, Dallas Mavericks. When you look back at that time, my man's skin was re refreshing my memory about that time. There was that championship year, there was games where you didn't play, but when it got to playoff time, from what I heard, J Kid and Dirk were like, we need Deshaun, we need Deshaun starting. What do you, what do you, what do you, what is like your memory of that time in Dallas and winning that championship? Well, I was kind of like a throw-in with that trade, you know, with uh, Brendan Haywood and Karan Butler. So when I got here, I really didn't play. Uh, they was really high on uh, Roddy Boubois, I think. He broke his foot. <laughs> yeah, that's what happened. Bro, <laughs> broke his foot. They threw me in the starting lineup. We won like 20 games in a row. Roddy Boubois came back. They set me on the bench for like three months. And then Dirk and them was like, yo, we're not going to win a fucking championship if you don't put Deshaun back in the starting lineup. And they did it, and we won. And how much fun was that? Because as a fan, I've been very open. As much as I respect LeBron, and I don't take anything away from everything he's done on the court and what he's accomplished, but with the first run at Cleveland, the, you know, the run in, in, in Miami and then back to Cleveland. But the, that, that when I go to, from Cleveland to Miami, the way it was done and how it was done, I feel like the whole NBA to this day is still playing catch up. They're all trying to like team up. We have to team up, you know, and, you know, of course you, you want to have, you know, the best team. You want to have the best podcast. You want the best everything. But I feel like people are skipping the process, yeah. you know, and I hated it that fucking Miami Heat team. I hated them. And you, you seem to Why, have... Why, motherfucker? Well, I'll, I'll say this. I'll, 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 I'll say this. Because you seem to, like, play with that same chip. I mean, you had it wherever you went. But Dallas, you, Jason Terry, like, those guys, like, they, they, you had that, like, fuck these guys mentality. You know what? Can, can, can I ask something? Can I, let me say something about that. You know why Dallas beat Miami that series? Why? Dallas had a better coach. Yeah. Dallas, they had, they had Dirk. It was like three against one, but Dirk adjusted to the game. He stopped shooting threes and he went to the midst post. He went from three dribbles from the basket to one dribble. Uh. Dallas found out the weakness against Miami that Bosch couldn't check Dirk. And they post him up, pinch post, and Dirk just, that was a big difference in the game to me, but... He can tell you more about it. No, the game. no, I hear you. That's the me, bro. I was just watching the game. Eric Spogles, he was just like Pat Riley's son. He gave him the job. Right. He learned on the job. A lot of coaches do that. So, they, you know, even though Miami came back and win after that, they gave him a lot of credit. But still, you know, LeBron was the high IQ in basketball probably ever, him and Magic, to me. So... They figured out, you know, team beat you, and then next year you come back, you always, you're supposed to win when you come back the second time. Right. Like Cleveland lost the Golden State the first time, they beat him the second time. That's how basketball go. You want to get better at one player if you lose, not four or five. Right. Okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. No, sorry. <laughs> no, you're a legend. You're the... Dude, Deshaun, like, what was the mentality? Obviously, there's respect. You're all pros. You're all great. So it's not like this craziness that's in the fans' heads. But... There was a little bit, it seemed like a sense from that team, like, nah, you guys ain't just coming in here and doing this shit right away. It's not happening. I think we just had, like, a, a bunch of, like, mixture. We had old school with Jason Kidd. You know, when I came in the league, my, uh, my veterans was Carl Malone and John Stockton. So, you know, I came in a situation where I was getting punked by the old heads, you know? The, the, I came in, Oakley was with the Wizards. Uh, GP, I think, at that time was... Uh, uh, Miami, Miami or the Lakers, something like that. So when I came up, you can walk around and just, you know, they was, they was sunning you. So I grew up like, I'm a son of the next person. You, you know, I, I, it happened to me. <laughs> I'm not gonna get one. I'm not gonna be in a situation where I got talked too crazy. I'm gonna talk to people crazy too. And I feel like we, I feel like we had that. Then we had the passing, the selfishness. And like you said, the coaching, the plays, Dirk was taking good quality shots. And, uh, I, you know, that time when they was coughing, uh, D Wade and, um, uh, LeBron James was coughing when uh, Dirk had the flu and he dropped 50. That's when I was like, yeah, we got this ring like a motherfucker. 
<laughs> and another thing, Dirk was the best offensive player for us shooting the ball. He might have been more efficient, but he was the better shooter in the whole series. So it's hard to beat because Dirk was, I mean, they talking about Bird. Dirk was a beast. I mean, what Dirk did against yeah, that little one it foot was like shit you couldn't beat. block. It was like Dirk. That little it's, one it's, foot it's, thing you know couldn't, it's just like rap couldn't block almost. that for nothing. They trying to compare this new junk to what really was good in the 80s and 90s. It ain't no comparison. Uh, no comparison. You can't compare with eight guys on one song. Ain't with, song only even three minutes. I mean, really? <laughs> <laughs> Come on with it. Stop playing. These new rappers, I mean, go in the studio and find something. Be a Take man. Something. It's a man game. They know, like, really, we ain't need no cheerleaders. You gonna come out, be a man. So, Oak, you know, what, oh. when you, when you, you, you've, right. been, you've been a part of the NBA for, yeah. for a long time. You're still a part of it. Right. You, you know, you're part of the big three. You're so respected. When you see, like, I'm always going to love the NBA. But when I see, like, the kids coming into the NBA, and I want everybody to get their money. I'm right. not, I got a great life. I'm right. blessed. Right. But when I see the kids with these attitudes like debutantes, right, right off the bat, yeah. you know, that's the thing that concerns me that, like, you know, there's... There's got to be some steps. Like, take your time. You're 19. When you're 25, you're going to be even better. You're going to be only 20 fucking five. When you see, like, what concerns you about the NBA, just as a fan and as a participant? There's no more old heads. Disrespect, no structure. I mean, we drunk milk, they drank water. It's a big difference. I know. Break it down. My thing is, they keep saying it's a new league. When the rim don't change, the size of the court up and down and five guys on the floor, it ain't never the new game to me because you still have to know the fundamentals. It's no more fundamental than structure in basketball. That's why your best two or three teams, the East Coast, West Coast, always going to have the best chance of winning. But these younger guys, I mean, they sensitive. You said something about them, you know. I mean, really... Some of them should wear dresses while they playing basketball because they, yeah. they, they act like Somebody girls. They act like girls. One of these motherfuckers gonna wear a dress. <laughs> Gerald, that's that's been your prediction. You said that. I said one of these motherfuckers gonna come out in the tunnel in a dress. Oh yeah, they should. I said it. It, it fit the style for the day. So so who you think is that going that person gonna be? Westbrook. <laughs> oh shit, I knew you. Were gonna say I'm gonna tell you that now. Oh, baby. He just pushed the envelope. Bye, bye, we ain't going with it. <laughs> And I love what's the next? Westbrook. I we love, love this motherfucker. He nice. Hold on, hold on. But what's on, next? Hold on. <laughs> hold on. You. Hold you, on. You got to do, right. do a song for this I ain't motherfucker. Gonna, I ain't going to say. Right. No, Vaseline. I ain't going to say the MVP is going to walk out in the dress, man. Come Watch on, Watch what man. I tell you. That ain't going to happen. All right. All right. That ain't going to happen. He wearing right. Olivia Newton-John shit now. GP. Yeah. We, we, you know, and just in, you know, you have a son that's a part of it. Like, when you look at the league as a participant, as a fan, do, like, I honestly, this is, this is no bullshit. I, I, this week, when the Kyrie thing, it was either this week or, or the, the top of last week, when that thing was announced, I, I remember I heard about it in the morning, and I, I, and I was in the shower, and I was like, I could see myself in a few years, 10 years, where I don't care as much as I care now. Like, when people see me talking shit about the league, when people see me getting upset about it when I go on shows, it's really because I'm a fan and I care about it. You know, I care about the competition. I care about the fact that, you know, Real Housewives of New York is more interesting than the first and second round of the Eastern Conference Finals. Yeah. You know, like, I, I care about that. There's no... There's no risk factor for the Cleveland Cavaliers in the East because everything, like, I, I, I care about the fact that Kyrie, as much as I love and respect the shit out of him, you know, will just be like, you know, when he's got his own shoe, he's the man in Cleveland, he takes the last second shots. Bad will, decision. Will want to leave there. Despite the fact that it's Cleveland, you know I've had rap, issues with Cleveland. Over rap, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off, Rap. No, I'm going to tell you why this is all going on. And we gonna know, and Cuba uh, contested this, and I think this is where he got the big three concept from because he watched us. You remember he made the song, "The Lakers Beat the Supersonic." Shit, he was over there <laughs> yeah, laughing at me when he was, I when I was doing it. That was my ass. Y'all gotta forget real life. But what happened is, as you mentioned, my my son is in the league, but we gave him a silver spoon. They grew up a little different. You know, they didn't grow up having to go on the playgrounds and play this three-on-three -three basketball and rough it out and get beat up going to neighborhoods and do that. So when I came in the league, like 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 uh, Deshaun said, he had an old head. Yep. 
I had, there you go. I had Xavier McDaniel, a dude that would break my neck if I didn't go bring him breakfast at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> See, I was a number two pick and I still had to get off the plane and put the go. bags on in the cold underneath the plane to help the other people. Wow. Then in the, eight, in the 90s, we had players on our team. We had four and five good players that can make the, that make the all-star team. The Knicks was all, they was always great. You know, you had them teams. We always had the Lakers, we had, the, we had the Sonics, we had Sacramento, we had Phoenix. We had a lot of teams over there that had five players, Utah, that had five or six players that could make it. Portland, yeah, we, I said that. So what I'm saying is, is it took me almost three years to start starting in the All-Star game because I had old heads in front of me. You know what I'm saying? And we had respect for that. You know, and that's what we did. We respected each other and did that. But then these kids nowadays, y'all got to understand, they're getting drafted at 19 after the first pick, and then the next year they're still in the lottery and they get the second pick, and you got another 19-year-old you've drafted. So why would I respect you if you're the number one pick? I'm the number two pick, and I'm making the same amount of money. And I'm going to make the amount of money you make. So they can cry to the NBA all the time, talking about we don't want no um, training camps. We don't want no double days. We only want four days, and then we go to play in the games. That's crazy. You know what I'm saying? We didn't have that. When we was coming up, we had two weeks of double days. Yep. And I we mean, worked. Three hours. And we worked, we, and we worked out two or nine, three hours. 12, five, yeah. wow. And they could bring us in here and do what the hell they wanted to do, and we had to make it, and we had to sign a contract for seven and eight years for like 21 million. Now they signing four years, 200. Ooh. So shit, you know, what you expect? Yeah. They gonna run everything. So that's why you don't like basketball no more because the simple fact is, it ain't like when we was there. Yeah. That's why the people was liking our big three because what they say, it reminds me of the oh, old school yeah. days. Yep. You see what I'm yeah. saying? Structure. It's some that's because we bang. We bang in this league. Yeah. They like that because, and that's why it's popular. Hold that whistle. Do you think there's a happy medium where the kids, the players, can get what's rightfully theirs and make their money and they could sort of bring a more competitive playing field across the, the board? I'm not mad at them for getting their money. I, I'm not, not, I'm mad, not mad at them for getting their money. Get your money. I want everybody to get their money. They all can get their money. Including if, this motherfucker with the Trump hat. Make your money. <laughs> <laughs> He's still here. No, you better shut your ass up. This motherfucker's still, still here. He you got say anything on. about Trump, we gonna bust yeah, your head. Yeah, we got Oakley in the motherfucking yeah, house. Yeah, you say anything. Why you ain't got Obama yeah. hat, motherfucker? Yeah. No, but what got, we think is... What, but what is, is there a way to... Is there a way to <laughs> Even the difference where the players could get what they're worth, and I want them to all get their money and keep the competitiveness. No, it, they're not going to get competitive no, because they want to see get that back. Yeah, this game is That's about a, a video game. It's like now. music almost. Yeah. It's just like, music and basketball are so similar. It's, it's lost art and music. It's about numbers I mean, too. Everybody trying to get numbers. You don't have the people who can just come up with them thoughts and minds and they grind stuff. I mean, it's all erratic, you know. The old guys are always going to come with something like what they do best because they get pioneers. You, when you're a leader, you got to lead. You know, when somebody says you ain't leading, you're trying to be a copycat, you can't do both. The basketball, now this new generation, they hook on their stuff. They hooked on funnies. Right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's AAU. Right. They figure like it's AAU. No matter what you say or what legend said this and that, we're going to shoot threes. We can't shoot them. I think a lot, too. A lot of us, these young cats is soft. You know, like back in the day, you had Gary Payton and Sean Kemp and some other people on the team, and they all knew they were the man. Nowadays, it's like, oh, you don't pass me the ball. I want to leave. Oh, I don't have the commercial. I don't have the shoe deal. I want to leave. When we come into town, it don't say Kyrie and the Cavaliers. It says LeBron and the Cavaliers. That's what these young cats is on. Back in the day, it was all about balling, getting your numbers, winning. Winning. Seeing the playoffs, seeing the towels go crazy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's what it was about. Well, back in basketball. The back in the days, you're not going to come to New York and have a party, and I know about it. I'm gonna, <laughs> before the starting lineup, I'm going to come and tell you, you fucked up. <laughs> no, respect my city, respect my team. Now they have parties two days. And it's just how it is now. They have parties to come in at four in the morning. You know they don't care. Oak, the New York Knicks. The the, the when when you got there, which by the way, I think I told you this. That Another Knicks story. God damn, man. <laughs> He's, yeah. Hey, hey yeah. he's stuck on this. I'm, I'm, cool. I'm with you with that. Every time I Fuck walk down the street, man. this man come up and to I'm me about New York, York story. Fuck them Knicks. 
Damn. Damn. Remember, we, me and me, what year did you get traded to the Knicks? 1988, the day you got traded, me and this dude here walking to the six train, cross the street from the Lenox Hill Hospital. It was during the spring or like the late or early summer. I was like, oh shit, there's Charles Oakley. You had the little fro, wasn't all great. You still look fantastic. I said, yo, Oak, what the fuck are you doing here? And you went like this. And this is before ESPN Twitter. You was like, I just got traded here. And we were like, oh shit. And then we got on the train. You went into the hospital, I think, for your physical. Absolutely. So when I got traded, it was basically like Michael Spinks and Tyson fight in Atlanta City. I mean, like, really before the bell sound, I got traded to start the fight. But, uh, I mean, hey, New York was great to me. I, you know, hope I gave the fans a great time. But I think that New York was something special. And I tell everybody about, you know, I seen Q one time, they performed in New York. Back in the day, I mean, New York, everybody in New York just opened their arms, and the city just embraced people, you know. It's a lot of things going in New York, but at the end of the day, New York show love. You know, they, it's not a haters, but um, I don't know what's going on with the Knicks. They just, they, they, they like... They ain't been they, shit they, since they, they, they had you. They, they ain't been they shit since a, they had you. They, they need to like, sign you to about a two-year contract <laughs> right now. Absolutely. Yeah, I trust me. We can't they, talk about the Knicks, Yeah, man. man. Nobody wants to talk about the yeah. New York Dicks, right. man. Let's go to something else. They need, talk they need leadership. All right, All listen. Over. I, I'm a, I know you guys want to go watch this fight. I want you guys to stand up. Thank these guys for coming. Icons, yo. Oh, oh, Icons. And movie stars, bitch. Thank you guys for coming.